Welcome students, and this is a mini lecture on Henry David Thoreau and civil disobedience. Uh, we don't actually read Walden, uh, which is his most famous work, uh, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that uh, he wrote Walden, and it is a book about his experience living in Walden Pond, which is actually in Massachusetts. Uh, I would highly recommend if you ever have a chance to actually go and visit Walden Pond. It is in, I believe, Lexington, um, so it's a little bit south of North Shore Community College, but it is worth a visit to kind of explore and see the space that he lived in and has been made famous ever since. So Henry David Thoreau lived from 1817 to 1862. Uh, not a particularly long life as we've compared to other writers uh, really only about 45 years old uh, which he never got to see the end of the Civil War uh, which when we look at ci uh, civil disobedience I think will be a or when you look at civil disobedience I think will be a interesting thing to consider all right so some things about him uh, born in Concord Massachusetts actually that's where I believe that's where Walden is, is Concord, not Lexington. Um, he was a student of, of Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and so he too followed in that line, in that tradition of tra uh, the transcendental m movement. And unfortunately, well, I don't know if I should say unfortunately, but he was not well received in his time. I mean, he, he, he pieced together a living, but a lot of his works weren't really acknowledged as great um, or significant or relevant um, until mu until after his death, um, and that's the case, of course, with a good deal of the ra the authors that we read in this course. Is that their their legacy, their significant works, aren't really established or aren't really acknowledged until after their death. So that's something to keep in mind. Is that if you're doing you know some kind of significant work in your life, it may not be valued in, in this lifetime. So the major works that we're looking at, um, or the major works worth mentioning here would be A Civil Disobedience, which we're going to talk about, uh, Walden, as I mentioned, and A Plea for, for Captain John Brown, and that one you'll read, and it, again, as I said, both, both that one and Civil Disobedience are interesting thoughts uh, as we look at the Civil War. So civil disobedience, uh, the text was written, it was largely his response to what had happened um, in 1848. And in 1848, the United States gets into the Mexican-American War. And when I say gets into it, largely provokes and starts the Mexican-American War, um, and in fact, Notoriously, the newspapers uh, were responsible for pushing the United States into this war, which is fascinating. That happens again in 1898, and you know there's some that would argue that that happened in the Iraq War uh, in 2003. So we get into this war, and Henry David Thoreau does not find he approves of the war. Uh, he, he does not like the idea of the war, and so he decides to be what he calls civilly disobedient. And this idea of civil disobedience is that you do not y you do not physically fight back, but you fight back by resistance. You fight back, in this case, by refusing to pay the poll tax. Um, he refused to pay the poll tax, believing that he could not contribute money that was ultimately going to contribute to the war. So this lends him a fine, it puts him in in, j in the local jail, um, and some of his friends bail him out, uh, of which he's not happy about. He, he gets bailed out by his friends and he's very upset about because of the fact that he was trying to make a point, and that point kind of got destroyed when his friends bail him out of prison. So he he gets out of prison and he writes this essay uh, and he even delivers it at one point to a group of people but the essay largely focuses on just that this idea of civil be civil disobedience what it is what it means and it's a prominent idea an idea that of course was used um, all the way up through the present so we you know we see it uh, we saw it in the use of 
you know, Gandhi used civil disobedience, Martin Luther King used civil disobedience, even uh, people in the uh, people protesting the Iraq War, the uh, the wall, the um, Occupy Wall Street movement. There's th this idea has been uh, a lot of environmental groups are continually using civil disobedience to try to make their point. So let's look at look at a few excerpts. There are thousands who are in the opinion opposed to slavery and to the war, who yet in effect do nothing to put an end to them, who esteeming themselves, children of Washington and Franklin, sit down with their hands in their pockets and say they know not what to do and do nothing, who even postpone the question of freedom to the question of free trade and quietly read the price cur prices current along with the, the latest advi advices from Mexico after dinner. And it may be, fall asleep over them both. What is the c price current of an honest man and patriot today? They, he they, they hesitate and they regret and sometimes they petition, but they do nothing in earnest and with effect. They will wait, well disposed, for other, to, for other to remedy the evil, that they may no longer have to have it to regret. At most, they give up only a cheap vote in a feeble countenance and god speed to the right as it goes by them they are nine hundred and ninety nine patrons of virtue to one virtuous man but it's easier to deal with the real professor of a, of a thing than the temporary guardian of it so thoreau is setting up here and saying you know it's great we we have a lot of people that can be opposed can not like things that are going on and uh, you know and in doing so argue that they themselves are you know the heirs of the heir apparents to Washington and Franklin but at the end of the day just sit there and say you know I oppose this important thing but I don't know what to do and therefore I'm gonna do nothing and we've seen this we, we know people in our own lives who are vehemently against something that's happening. They 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 say, you know, I, I I really don't like pollution. I really don't like this war. I really don't like this way things are being done. But I uh, can't do anything. So um, I'm just gonna take a look at you know what's the latest stock prices. Uh, I'm going to go watch some reality TV. So. Thoreau is calling that into question, right? He's saying, what is, the par what is the price current of an honest man and patriot today? Because that, you know, in a country that was born of revolution, born of people overthrowing a king and saying, no, we're going to do this our way, people, it, it's hard for him to see, the, see these people with things that are upsetting them to stand still, to wait, well disposed, for others to remedy the evil right and so he you know he says yeah people vote right towards the end at most they give up only a cheap vote in feeble countenance and godspeed to the right so he's saying yeah people vote but of course you know if their if their vote doesn't win well whatever happens is you know right and therefore they again don't have to do anything about it so you have that 999 patrons of virtue Right, sure, they they pay respect to virtue, but they themselves are not necessarily virtuous because they don't pursue those things that they seek, uh, or they don't pursue to right those things that they see are wrong. So we get here into his his criticism of voting um, in a democratic republic and the issues that he has of it. All voting is a sort of gaming, like checkers or backgammon, with a slight moral tinge to it, a playing with right. And wrong with moral questions and betting naturally accompanies it the character of the voters is not state I cast my vote perchance as I think right but I am not vitally concerned that that should prevail 
I am willing to leave it to the majority. Its obligation, therefore, never exceeds that of expediency. Even voting for the right is doing nothing for it. It is only expressing to men feebly your desire that it should prevail. A wise man will not leave the right to the mercy of chance, nor wish it to prevail through the power of the majority. There is but little virtue in the action of the masses of men. When the majority shall at length vote for the abolition of slavery, it will be because they are indifferent to slavery, or because there is little but there is but little slavery left to abolish by their vote. They will be they will then be the only slaves. Only the his vote can hasten the abolition of slavery who asserts his own freedom by his vote so thoreau is really throwing out a, a very interesting gambit here he's saying voting's nice but really it's it's just a game and that game is not particularly impressive if we're providing or, or, or emphasizing the moral element to it right that is people vote for what they think is right but of course, if it if it doesn't happen, if it doesn't pass, then oh well, there's nothing you know. Th there's nothing of it. And I think he makes a great point uh, towards the end. You know, he says the moral man, ca you know, a wise man will not leave the right to the mercy of chance, nor wish it to prevail through the power of the majority. In that there is but little in the action of the masses of men. When the majority shall at length vote for the abolition of slavery, it will be because they are indifferent to slavery. So he's saying it's not when everybody agrees that it's time to, you know, feel or congratulate or pat yourselves on the back. That's not really virtue. Virtue is knowing what's right despite the masses of people saying, no, that's not right. That's that, that you know, or no. We don't really want to do that, but knowing it's right. I think a good example that we're seeing today is, of course, the uh, the shift into into providing equal marriage for all throughout the country. Now, 15 years ago, or you know, 10 and 15 years ago, as that shift started to occur, you know, the people that the pe the people fighting for it. Thoreau would say, you know, those are the true virtuous people. But in another 20 years, when we have, you know, when, when there is going to be 35, 40, 45 states, right, after now that the, the federal government has disabled the Defense of Marriage Act and allowed for filing, um, for IRS filing of same-sex couples, you know, it is at a point in which, well, people are voting more for it because they're indifferent to it, not because they feel morally inspired to make the change so this this is where Thoreau this is where Thoreau is really hitting at he's saying well by the time everybody agrees on something it's loss you know the, the, the people voting for it aren't necessarily being virtuous men are being you know are, aren't showing character but going along with the masses it's a very interesting thought because it raises questions about just how much or when should you be acting on something. The soldier is applauded who refuses to serve in an unjust war by those who do not refuse to sustain the government which makes the war. It is applauded by those who act in a, whose act in authority he disregards and sets at, at naught, as if the state were penitent, but not to the degree that it let off sinning for a moment. Thus, under the name of order and civil government, we are all made to pay homage to and support our own meanness. So here again we have Thoreau saying, okay, we applaud soldiers who refuse to fight f unjust wars. Um, and, you know, that that's great, but there's a certain amount of hypocrisy there in that on the one breath we are, we are, we are applauding that soldier for refusing to fight, but then we're funding the government that is fighting. Right, it's it, you know, and this is an idea again that came that that's so timely that that's still relevant today, um, when we look at wars. That if you see it as an unjust war, if you perceive the Iraq War as an unjust war, you know, then you applaud the the soldier who refuses to fight, but you still go on paying the government to fight that war, 
and there is a question about that there there's a challenge to that of just how you know what is the worth of your applause to that soldier when in fact you're part of the problem that puts him into that situation where he has to refuse to fight so again, you know, Thoreau raises a lot of interesting and fascinating questions in this essay, and I really do encourage you to, you know, as you're taking a look through, think about what he says and where where and how it's applicable to the world today because i think you know in a lot of ways his his discussion to his discussion around civil disobedience holds a lot of weight about how we understand uh even politics today thank you very much see you in the next lecture